Hi, and welcome to the last day. 10 a.m., it's early, thanks for showing up. I want to talk to you today about how to trade off server utilization and tail latency. The previous talk talked about latency SLOs and just said things about, yes, that's the 99th percentile, but uh, what, what does this 99th percentile of the latency, how is it made up? So, uh, quick intro slide about myself. Uh, I'm an SRE working at Google in Sydney. I currently work on Cloud Data Store and Firestore and worked on other Google internal storage systems before. Um, so for those storage systems, you, you, you usually try to measure the tail latency in order to make it as close to the mean as possible. So that's why I have a very keen interest in this topic. In general, I try to make visualizations to understand things. And I'll try to do that in this talk. I hope you can see the slides. Um, if you find any of this interesting, come talk to me afterwards or ask questions. But it's just a 20-minute talk, so, so it'll be a bit quick. The slide deck is already published at the conference website, including the speaker notes, which contain a bunch of additional links to uh, like Wikipedia pages and interesting papers. So if you find that interesting, go to the conference website and download it. A quick disclaimer, I'm going to talk about a thing called queuing theory, theory, which is essentially its own subfield in computer science or statistics. Um, for those who have I'll spend a lot of time with this. Uh, I'll gloss over a lot of the subtleties and I'll not use any formulas because that tends to lose the audience. Instead, the approach I'll be taking is I'll only do numerical simulations and look at graphs. So if I want to find out what happens to the 99th percentile of requests, I'll just do 10,000 runs of the thing and then figure out where is the 99th percentile instead of calculating it accurately. Okay, queues are everywhere. Let's talk about them. All of you probably manage some sort of servers, and then you have this, this concept of you have the in-flight requests, which are still on the wire, and then they arrive at a server, and that's where they queue up. And then the server handles the request and sends back a response. But queues are actually everywhere. They are in a typical web server, but already your network card has a queue, your hard drive has a queue for the IOPS, so it can reorder them in there. Uh, your memcache server might have queues. The database has a queues. Even restaurants have queues. And you can analyze the behavior of those queues, right? Um, to keep things simple, for the, for the purposes of this talk, let's define three things real quick. What is a server? It is a binary that handles requests. So not the physical machine, it is just like a binary accepting requests and giving replies back. Um, for example, a web server, database server, or your memcache server. The utilization shall be defined as the fraction of time that the server is busy in the bottleneck dimension, and usually we care about CPU. So for example, if you measure over a 60 second interval, um, and you find that 30 seconds of the time the CPU was executing some sort of instructions, then you call that 50% utilization. And the tail latency should be arbitrary defi arbitrarily defined as the 99th percentile uh, of a set of requests. So if you have 100 requests, you take the latency of the second slowest and that exhibits the tail latency. Okay, so here's a schematic diagram of how a queue works. You have these incoming requests, they are waiting to be processed, and then there is a processor, usually your CPU or your, your program that is handling these requests. Now, there's a certain time that these requests need to wait in the queue, right? They come in, then they wait for, for a certain time. If the queue is empty, that time is zero, but if there are other requests in the queue already, they have to wait their turn. Um, and then there's a service time, which is the time that actually is spent processing the request. So you could call the queue time the unproductive time, the service time the productive time. And if you sum those two up, then you get the request latency, which is what an external user of a system would perceive as the latency of the request. They don't really know how much time is spent in the queue versus actually handling the request. In general, you control the queue time by figuring out how to make the, the, the utilization lower, so the queue is more empty and you can control the service time by just having better algorithms and spending less instructions on executing these things or caching better, stuff like that. So, given that the, the latency that a user observes from the outside is made up of two components, what, we wanna bring somehow the, the entire latency down in general, right? So, in order to do that, we want two things at the same time, but they're at odds. First, we want high utilization, and second, we want low tail latency. We want high utilization because it means we have to deploy fewer servers, we have to buy fewer compute instances at your cloud provider, et cetera, right? Like you wanna run at high utilization because it's good for the business, you spend less money. At the same time, um, we want uh, low tail latency, which means uh, the users are happy, 
the app feels snappy and responsive all the time. If you have a big fan out of your queries, uh, you bound your tail latency like that. But in order to have high utilization, what you want is that whenever the processor is free, there should be a request in the queue. So you want a somewhat filled queue in order to sustain high utilization. But if you have a somewhat filled queue, your, your tail latency always is influenced by how many things are in the queue. So you want it to be both full and empty at the same time. So that can't really work, right? So here's a common problem that I've observed in the past. When we're talking about utilization, um, the way we are talking is often not very precise. So here's, here's Joe on the left who says, our web server servers handle 100 requests per second each. Requests take five milliseconds on average. The server farm's utilization is 50%. All of these might be true statements. But Jane, on the other hand, very correctly thinks, are you using time averages, really? Your statement could mean everything and nothing at all. So, what is this person actually saying? 100 requests per second. So that is an average over some sort of time span, which means if you have 100 requests per second, on average, you have one every 10 milliseconds. And they take five milliseconds on average to process. Yeah, sure, but maybe some of them will be processed faster and some of them will be processed slower. On average, it's five milliseconds. And therefore, because you're you're busy five milliseconds out of every 10 milliseconds, you have 50% utilization. So just from this statement, the picture you could form in your head is this request timeline. So time goes on the x-axis from left to right, and per row you have a single request, and the request is in execution. So this box is five milliseconds wide, and then there's a five millisecond gap where the CPU is not busy anymore. And then the next request arrives, and they're all perfectly spaced, uh, just like in real life. Hmm? <laughs> so, this is what you could interpret from the statement when someone just uses time averages and you assume that, oh yeah, we actually have a constant inter-arrival time. Every 10 milliseconds, like clockwork, a request arrives. Reality in general looks messy. So this is much closer to reality because we have both variable inter-arrival and service times, meaning that sometimes requests arrive in a very quick succession, like here in the middle, for example, almost at the same time. And sometimes uh, requests take longer, and sometimes they take shorter to process. So think about like your application has a cache, or um, there's like sometimes uh, your query returns one kilobyte of data and sometimes one megabyte, right? There's orders of magnitudes of difficulty in between those. So, they shade, so there should be some variance in the actual processing time. So a request here in this diagram is actually made up of the red uh, request waiting time and the request in execution time. And again, you could think about the red part of the time of this request as unproductive time. It's just sitting idle in the queue. Right, so the white space here um, is when the processor is not busy. If um, this is a simulation for 50% utilization, and if you, if you would expand that for the entire simulation, you would see roughly that 50% of the time there's just white space between requests. But sometimes they come in too fast and then somehow they queue up and you have lots of red in those requests. If you're curious about what the title of that thing means, MM1, it just means there's a single processor and the inter-arrival time is what's called memoryless because the requests are independent from another and um, the request execution time is also memoryless. So it just defines what sort of distribution the randomness follows. So now if we talk about the tail latency of such a scenario, I've moved forward in time, so we're at uh, maybe second number two in the, in, in the simulated observation, and the request in the middle actually it exhibits the 99th percentile latency. And what we can see is that it's mostly waiting, right? It could be super quick to serve. It's maybe, yeah, on average, requests take five milliseconds to serve, but this one is mostly waiting. So that's what the user perceive. It's mostly unproductive time. Okay, so instead of looking at these timelines, we could just aggregate all the data and draw histograms. Um, here are four histograms together for the same sim simulation. On the top left, you see the service time. So if no one would ever wait in a queue for anything, this is how fast the requests would take. And I talked about this having some variance. Your service might look very different. I'll show another slide with a different service time. Um, in this case, I just took an exponential service time with an average of five milliseconds. But we can see that the vast majority of them 
are, uh, uh, take less than five milliseconds, but there's a somewhat longer tail of requests that just naturally take longer than five milliseconds. But on average, it's five. We see that naturally already we get uh, 22 milliseconds at the 99th percentile, even if you don't have to wait. Now, essentially what, um, if you would record for any, any one request that comes in, how long does it wait in the queue and how do, does it actually, how long does it process? You would get a graph like this, where you see that um, more than half of the time, the time spent in the queue is nothing at all because you have 50% utilization. As the request arrives, there's a 50-50 chance that the queue is entirely empty and you can start processing right away. But once there is a request in there, you get this long tail. Um, and then if we add the two together, we find that essentially the service time from above gets dragged out to the right. So on average, you'll have uh, twice as long an observed latency for the outsider, and the tail is 44 milliseconds. Um, it's very unlikely, so you should note that this 44 is not the same as the sum of these two uh, P99s, because it's very unlikely that a request that is both difficult to serve is, is the same request that also happens to arrive at an unlucky point in time when the queue has lots of requests. That's why the, the P99 of the sum of these is strictly lower than the sum of the P99s. And we can see that the number of requests that you find as you arrive at the server also has a very similarly shaped distribution. In particular, you can see I did 20,000 samples of these, and because the utilization is 50%, exactly 10,000 samples found the queue completely empty. Okay, so you might say, well, I don't believe much service time looks like this. I, I, I crafted an algorithm that always has constant service time. It always takes exactly five milliseconds, every request. So that's this graph, so same, uh, same graph, but different service time. On average, we have five milliseconds, but at the tail, we also have five milliseconds, because that's good. Um, but we still have a queue, and we see that this time, at the lower left graph, the total latency um, suddenly develops a tail, right? Because sometimes you'll find items in the queue, and then you have to wait until they're complete, and each of the items in the queue takes, on average, five milliseconds to complete. So you get this very long tail, and even though like, the algorithm you crafted is super good, because you have a queue in front of it, you'll end up with a tail latency of 21.5 milliseconds. Okay, so the first takeaway is that a significant amount of tail latency is due to queuing effects. Right? It is just, uh, you never really know until you measure, but if you've not measured it, you shouldn't assume it's zero, right? It, it'll probably be a significant amount of, uh, of uh, tail latency. Now, I just uh, sampled from mathematical distributions, and they are very much standard distributions, but you could do this for your own service. And the way to do this is that you get a representative set of inter-arrival latencies. So for example, for a short amount of time, you just log the timestamp of every arriving request, and then you just sort them in order and compute the delta to the next one. Now you have a distribution of how long is the time between any one request arriving. You can plot it and see how it actually looks like. Um, then you can either measure or estimate the service time. Um, estimating is easy. You could just pause it saying it is always five milliseconds. Um, measuring is hard because usually you need something like very precise per thread counters and they have overheads, so that's sometimes difficult. Uh, but you see that sometimes tail latency effects dominate just because of the waiting time, not because of the service time. Um, and then you just sample from both of those calculations um, and run them through, through a simulator and generate these graphs. And in order that you can do this easily, in the speaker notes, uh, I've linked to uh, the equivalent of a Jupyter notebook that has a bunch of Python code to generate these graphs. Uh, so it should be fairly easy to replicate. So. We, all, we didn't talk about utilization yet, right? Because the utilization in the previous example was 50%. So what if I go higher or lower? Does it change something? So you don't actually have to do that in prod and see it break in order to figure out what the effect uh, of increasing or decreasing utilization would be. There's an easy three-step process. So let's say um, I want to compute the desired utilization if I increase it by sorry, I, uh, I increase the utilization by 10%, what would happen? You just set like this value x to be 1.1, and then you 
uh, draw from your distribution, but divide the inter-arrival times by this 1.1. So you put them closer together because you're sending more requests to the server. But you keep the service time unchanged because your binary doesn't process things faster just because you send it more requests. If anything, slower, but we'll keep it constant. And that way, you can um, look at the at essentially how would your service perform at different utilization. The baseline is the first graph where we saw that uh, that the P99 is 50% in this example, but then you can essentially just say, let me space them out more in the utilization 30% graph, and you can see that the P99 moves to the left, but as you increase the utilization going down to uh, up to 95% CPU utilization, you see that the distribution just gets drawn out and you get a huge tail. The gray boxes around the P99 is half a percentile left and right in order to show you the uncertainty of the measurement. So what we can see is that this is pretty terrible, right? Like you can't really run your service at, at above 60% utilization maybe because your users will suffer. So queuing effects increase super linearly with utilization, right? The first time you increase your utilization by 10 percentage points, your latency suffers. The next time you do it, your latency suffers even more. Now you might object, uh, my service actually doesn't look like that because I have a multi-core service, right? I have multiple threads, I have a thread pool, it runs over all those threads, so I have a single queue, but I have multiple processors who will take off the items of the queue and process them. So now as, as an item arrives at the queue, it has to wait until the first out of four processors becomes free, which should be significantly better, right? Well, we can test that. You just ran it through the simulation again. This was the previous slide where you had a single core and we saw it is horrible. Now we run the same simulation again, but um, with, with four cores, and we see there are barely any queuing effects. So you have the service time, um, and the total latency after you add the time that you wait in the queue is hardly any different. So the question is, is that something you will always find? And the answer is yes. I've, uh, I've prepared a small slideshow where you just double the number of cores. We've, saw, we've seen this picture before. This is with a single core. It's terrible. You can't run at high utilization. At k equals two, you see that all the 99th percentiles, they move to the left, so the distribution has less of a tail. But still, above, let's say, 60% is still not a good territory to be in. At k equals four, you see that you could actually run at 80% utilization and your users probably wouldn't really notice. At k equals eight, you see that the utilization almost doesn't play a role unless you go beyond 90. And at k equals 16, even the 95th, even at 95% utilization, things are looking pretty good. So the takeaway here is that increasing the parallelism in your server will pull in the tail latency. Now there's an asterisk, right? Like, <laughs> it, it's, not a, it's not a panacea, right? Like, you have this magical mutex that protects your central data structure, and now you run it on 16 cores, so what, what will you get? Well, yeah, you'll have horrible tail latency because now you have a, essentially a queue in front of your mutex, right? Um, there are <laughs> yes, you just shifted the queue. Um, so these, there's no such thing as a free lunch, right? Like you have to do something, but in general you should increase the parallelism of your server. Um, there's also a thing called Amdahl's law and the universal scalability law that has a few more parameters and has a more scientific treatment of how much can you actually parallelize anything in your application. Links in the speaker notes. So um, in conclusion, what I think we should do is, when we talk about utilization, we should be more data-driven. This is an example of how I would imagine a conversation about utilization and tail latency goes. So Joe says, we run our web service at 50% utilization with this request into arrival time, but instead of citing averages, uh, he points to a graph that actually says this is the inter-arrival time. To save money, I want to target 65% utilization. What do you think? And Jane says, that sounds great, but Let's invest a few weeks into rewriting some of the core data structures to be lockless, and then run the service on larger 16 virtual CPU nodes instead and at 80% utilization. That way we save even more money and our customers remain happy. Right, so in essence you can trade these two things off, but you can also just make your uh, servers or instances larger. Make fewer of them, make them larger, more traffic per instance. A recap of the three takeaways. A significant amount of tail latency can be due to, due to queuing effects. If you haven't measured it, you probably don't know how bad it is, so you should go measure it. It's fairly easy. Um, 
queuing effects increase super linearly with utilization. So as you crank up the utilization, the first time it's easy, second time it just becomes harder and harder. And third, increasing the parallelism in your server will pull in the tail latency, but you need some proper software engineering to make sure it actually, uh, it actually works out well. Thanks, and if you have questions, now is the time. Hello. Hello. Thanks for the talk. Uh, Just shout the question, I'll repeat. Yeah, it's a, it it, it's, a, it's a good question. So, so your question is about like load balancing. How would you determine which CPU is free? Yeah. Um, I think you could approach this. Last year, I gave a talk here where, where I advocated the same thing, run larger instances, because then your variance between the, the fullness of, of servers goes down. Um, but there is a difference between asking over the network hey, backend, do you have capacity to take this request? Because that, that'll take like hundred, hundreds of microseconds versus a CPU uh, potentially even spinning to take new requests. If you run at high utilization, spinning is not gonna cost you very much because most of the time you'll not spin for long because you run at high utilization, right? So there's orders of magnitude difference in the um, time for, for a CPU to pull, to pull something from the queue. Does it answer the question? Yeah. Let's see if this one, oh, there you go, this one works. Um, so it didn't then also feed back some of your desired utilization that you might calculate back into some sort of admission control to try and keep the request rate below what you know you can handle with a reasonable tail? And yeah, so how something, would you do that? Yeah. yeah, something about admission control. I mean, this is hard, right? If, if you're lucky enough, um, that you work in some sort of setting where you have quality of service, where you have something like low latency and best effort type of request. Then you can generally run at much higher utilization because you can just deny admission for those low priority requests and they'll be retried in time, at some point in time. If you don't have that, the question is which one, um, yeah. which one do you sacrifice, right? Which one do you re reject? Um, Alternatively, uh, some people propose that you switch away from FIFO to LIFO. So not first in, first out queues where um, this is problematic, but to LIFO where in general you can run at very high utilizations and as you reach overload capacity, um, it degrades gracefully as opposed to everything um, stalls. That is also a way to approach the problem. Then you're unlucky to get in first just before it gets busy. Yes. Exactly, I think in general for these types of problems, what I would suggest is do simulations, right? Like because every, every service is different, has different characteristics. So the, yeah, usually you should, you should just take a sample of your traffic and try to replay it at different configurations in a simulator and that's probably yield you a good an answer. Um, another quick, quick question. Oh, sorry, are you done? Um, so when you say like, you know, you can, um, by having more parallelism, we can cut down our tail latencies. Are we making an assumption that um, each of these parallel cores take the same amount of time to process this request, or that they take, like, let's say, 4x longer? Because if it's the former, now we're just saying, like, you know, have 4x the capacity. Yes. So that, that's a good question. So you're, uh, there's a good paper about the like, brawny versus wimpy cores, right? Like, do, do you want a really good core that can serve requests super fast, or um, 
would you just uh, rather have cores that have low clock frequency, but they're super cheap to run? Um, it, the underlying assumption with these simulations is that instead of, let's say, having 100 web servers with one CPU each, you would now run 25 web servers, but they have four CPUs each. So it, it is more like you just run fewer instances, but on the, uh, on the same cores with, uh, but more cores per binary. That, that is the underlying assumption, right? Um, but in terms of the total number of requests we're processing, like you know, now we've just shifted it from, let's say, like one request per web server to like you know four yes. per each. Um, so I guess this makes the assumption that um, these are somehow faster because staying on the same core allows them to like access the same data structures versus running on like completely separate hosts. No, they they will become faster because as a request goes into the queue, it has four chances of a request completing very soon because you have four processors. So once it is in the queue, it has to wait. But the wait time is going to be much smaller because you go, um, it's like a random variable over how long until the next processor is free. But you take the minimum over four different random variables, which is significantly lower. Like th That's how you pull in tail the tail latency because you have four chances of a processor becoming free as opposed to one. Uh, in your uh, first graphs, you assume that the incoming requests are independent. If they're dependent, does that change the outcomes? So, good question. Uh, the, the, are the requests actually independent? Um, that's what I call memoryless interarrival time means essentially pe uh, requests are independent of one another. That is generally how you model like how people arrive at a restaurant or something like that or at, at the supermarket. Um, Earlier in the talk on, on Monday from Baidu, there was uh, the same statement was also questioned. Are requests actually independent? And no, they aren't, right? Like you load the main web page and it loads JavaScript. So like a request begets other requests directly. I found in looking at uh, the distributions that they are actually more bursty in general than, um, than the, the exponential distribution, which means they, they uh, sometimes they come in bursts and the lulls are longer, the, the, the times where no requests arrive at all. That's why I would suggest not just assuming memoryless arrival time because it's likely not true, um, and actually measure the inter-arrival time by just noting down the timestamp of every request and then turning that into a distribution because you'll probably find that it is worse than the textbooks assume. Yes, all the JavaScript inline. That's the solution. Okay, thank you very much.